The thing is going around. The thing is going around. Here I am. Are you there? A thing says seven. A thing says it looks like people and it has seven. Huh. Maybe there are already seven people here. I don't know. Aha! It says six now. Ha ha! Maybe someone left. <laughs> hi! You can say hi if you're here. Oh, they're coming in! And Karine is here, and Therese, and Melanie, and everybody that is, we see, Kathy and Jessica. Oh, it's so good to see you all. All those beautiful names, Karen and Julianne and Beth. Oh, oh, you're awesome. <sighs> and now I'm supposed to start everything ceremonially because that's what we're talking about today is ceremonially doing things it can be good um so i'm gonna start oh, sarah ellen eli donna diane more stephanie's and terry's and margaret's and gloria i love you people so here we are there's over 100 of us so i'm going in all right welcome to the gathering room i am martha beck did I get it right? I did. Okay. Fabulous. So today I wanted to talk about how everything is sacred. I think I called it everyday sacred or sacred every day or some other concatenation of those three words. Sacred every and day. And the reason is that I've been getting a lot of benefit from three precious allies. Well, four. My two dogs my son Adam, and the COVID virus. And it's been helping me realize a better way to be in the world um, as opposed to the way I was taught and the way you were taught, almost certainly. If you were raised, say, I don't know, in, a, in an undiscovered group of people in the jungle of, the, of Peru, then maybe you did not learn this, but I learned this, that you're supposed to rush through every day and that it, the, the hallmarks of the day are a list of tasks you must do, whether it's stuff that you are assigned to do, what you're meant to do, you're a mother or you're a father, so you get up and you do these things for your children, or you, you work at a specific place, so you get up and you do these things for your job, or you are a useful member of society, so you get up and you keep your yard clean and you like, do your civic duty or whatever. It's just a long list of tasks. You are your own taskmaster. And I've seen other cultures throughout my life that don't live this way, just flashes of them. And they always strike me as very strange. And it's, uh, when I was 20, I think I was 20, maybe I was 21, but it was my first trip to, ever to Indonesia. And I went to Bali. Now, of all the many islands of Indonesia, I think there are over a thousand islands, Bali is very special because there's an, a story that when the Dutch came to conquer it, because this was the time when European nations were conquering like there was no going home. They literally were just sailing around the world. If you've seen the comedian Eddie, Eddie Izzard, he talks about how they would land on a place and say, we claim this place for England. And the people who lived there would say, you can't claim this place for England. We live here. And they would say, have you got a flag? <laughs> no flag, no country. So they just, they took over and suppressed all these many, many, many cultures. Supposedly when they got to Bali, there's an old story that the Balinese, they have such an aesthetic way of going through the world, very artistic, very um, devoted to the sacredness of everything, but also to the beauty of things. So they wanted to show these invaders who they really were. So they all put on their beautiful, like, regalia their attire they make this gorgeous filigree jewelry and hats like hats such as you have never seen before and gorgeous colors on their clothing and they went out to meet the Dutch with all their most precious objects and according to legend the Dutch leader was so impressed by this that he said you know what I'm not gonna ruin this we're not we're not stopping here we're leaving so it was the one island that didn't get oppressed by European domination. So the original, well, the ancient, ancient way of living there 
is still going on today. And of course, it's become a huge tourist attraction, but it's still, it's, it retains its purity. And I went to Bali, as I said, when I was 20 or 21, and I was fascinated by all the, I thought, I'm so lucky I got here on the very day that they're having a big ceremony. I was walking down the street and there, was, there were temples everywhere, little sacred places with beautiful carvings in the in stone and overarching trees with flowers. And I went into one and it, I thought, I'll just watch the ceremony. And I don't know what kind of ceremony it was, but there were candles involved. There were packets of food wrapped in bamboo. There was much dancing involved. There were bells being rung. It went on and on and on. It went on for hours. I didn't even see the end of it. And then I found out that it was just an ordinary day in Bali. Um, the next day, I, w I was driven around by this um, by a local guide, and he was telling me all about the different celebrations they have, and, and they have so much ritual and so much um, protocol. And one of the things he told me, he was from a caste, so they have social castes there, that was lower than his wife's, and they'd fallen in love. And the greatest heartbreak of his life was that he had not been allowed to attend her tooth filing ceremony. I should look up what tooth filing ceremonies entail. I don't know. I just thought it was fascinating that they had this really important ceremony for filing someone's teeth. And because of protocol, he couldn't go. Anyway, so I thought, well, that's a strange culture. I thought at 21, in my defense, I was barely out of the womb. and. Um, I didn't see another culture like that in action for a while. And then I went to a, a blessing way ceremony of the Navajo Nation. Actually, later on in life, I actually called a ceremony. I, I talked to a friend I knew who knew a friend who was a Navajo medicine man. And I asked if we could have a ceremony to launch our efforts to save the world. I had just decided that all of us who, who love the earth are destined to try to save it in this lifetime. So I wanted a ceremony to launch it. I had a bunch of my friends come in and we thought, okay, we'll do this. I may have told you this before. We're gonna, we'll have the ceremony in the morning. Then we're gonna go hiking in the afternoon. And then we're gonna do, you know, like improv at night. We had all these things planned. <laughs> and uh, so we went to the place where we were gonna have the ceremony and the Diné people, which is what they call themselves, um, we just, we sort of rumbled up and were like, when do we get started? And they looked at us like, uh, okay. <laughs> they, they, you could tell they were sort of being patient and I couldn't, I didn't know what I'd done wrong. And they had brought all these long poles with which they were going to erect a teepee. And teepees are huge. This teepee was gonna be huge. It was like 20 feet in circumference. And so these poles were very long. And a bunch of us always wanting to help, you know, good Anglo-American want to help people. We all jumped up on this trunk, uh, this truck that had the poles on it and started unloading the poles. And that was just too much. And they said, stop. They're like, you want a ceremony? Guess what? The ceremony started the moment you called the ceremony. We are in ceremony right now. You are handling our grandmother's bones. You do not handle them that way. And they were so gentle and so loving. There was no, I mean, they were so loving, but they were like, no, that's not okay. You don't just throw things around when it's grandmother's bones. So um, that went on. We were going to do that for the morning. I think it was like eight hours later, I started thinking if I don't get some food soon, things are not going to go well with me. But by that time, there was so much tobacco smoke in the teepee that it was cutting my appetite anyway. <laughs> so, but it was, it was a truly, truly magical experience and the air just grew thick with sacredness. And as COVID has come in and stopped me from my usual running about doing tasks, what I've found is that my days have begun to resemble some of these non-Western cultures in that they become a sequence of sacred ceremonies, sacred rituals. And the dogs do this, if you have dogs, I don't know if cats do this, but dogs learn ceremony very quickly. So one day I was, I was making toast and I came to the end of the loaf and there was that little gnarly piece that's been sort of burned on one side and I didn't want to 
use it for toast. So I just gave it to my golden retriever in three pieces. Every day since, and it has been years, the moment I appear in the morning, the dog runs to the place where she received the bread and starts tapping her toenails on the floor. Ha <laughs> ha! She doesn't bark or anything. She's too good for that, but she's just like, tippy tappy, tippy tappy, I need my morning bread. So that's the first thing every day is morning bread. Always in three pieces. If it's two, she's completely baffled. If it's four, she's like, what are you doing? It has to be three. Okay, good. After dinner, once I had some broccoli left over. I thought broccoli is good for dogs. So I gave each of our dogs, Claire and Bilbo, a little serving of broccoli after dinner. So every single dinner, the dogs, we're, we're in the middle of dinner and the dogs come circling like sharks. And if I forget to give them an after dinner vegetable, there's no peace in our lives ever. It, like the ritual must be observed. And Adam, interestingly enough, my 32 year old son who has Down syndrome, he's very sensitive to, um, to the energy of anything that we do. And sometimes he'll just rear back and say something. He's very quiet, but every now and then he'll raise his hand and, he'll, and if you call on him and he says, I want to say something. You say, okay, what is it? And he will lay down the law. And once he said, there is too much work in this house. After five, no work. After five, and at 5.30, we all together, we hang out. So, and we call it wine time because every now and again, Adam enjoys a glass of wine. He's 32, why should he not? He never gets drunk. So, wine time is a big ritual in our house. And we start to sort of, we start to sort of live for wine time and then we decided the mornings were a little confused. So then we decided that the whole family had to meet once the last person wakes up for morning communion, which originally lasted 15 minutes, but now can last for up to three hours because we're not going anywhere and nobody's looking in. So when we don't have too much to do, like morning communion can go for a long time. Then it's just kind of a jump. To, so it starts morning bread. Then I have to feed the birds because they've eaten all their bird seed during the night. So have the deer and the raccoons and everything. So I go fill the bird seed. Then we've got breakfast. We've got morning communion going on into the noonday hour. We have some work that occurs. Um, there is some cleaning that occurs. We call that ordering the realm. So we have to order our realm. It's all very ritualized. Then it's wine time. Can't ignore wine time. And wine time leads directly into dinner time, which leads directly into the after dinner vegetable ritual, which then leads to me watching two and no more than two situation comedy episodes with Adam. Then all adults besides Adam watch another show. Then there is the departing to various bedrooms. It's, and, and during the COVID, this it's like ritual has crowded every aspect of our lives. And every single time I have found myself so happy about ritual and ceremony and slowing down and savoring the experience and coming together and acknowledging that we're doing the same thing together. And I've remembered those times in Bali and in that teepee. And I realize that human life can be lived in the way that I try to create a painting or sculpture. It can be lived so that every stroke you put down is meant to be beautiful. It can be lived. My wonderful writer friend, Paula Keo, says we can live our lives as poems. Every single act considered, every single moment sacred. So here's a little list of instructions for how you can do that, and then I'll take some questions. First, start making every day sacred by picking something that you do every day that you genuinely enjoy. And it could be something that you kind of have to do, like making your bed. I actually enjoy making my bed. Um, but it's better if it's just purely joyful. Like, my, my oh, I left out morning meditation. I wake up, meditate for an hour first. Then I go down for morning communion. So morning meditation is something I love. I always open the window or go outside because I love to breathe the tree pheromones. So, and just, just the act of sitting and being calm and, and centering myself is incredibly
joyful. So get something that's really joyful for you, even if it's watching TV or playing a computer game, like, like Candy Crush it used to be one of my favorite rituals. I would sit with Adam during the TV time, because I'm not that into TV, and I would actually be playing Candy Crush. And it's very reinforcing. Things are shiny and they smoosh. It's amazing. And it was part of this sacred ritual that I have with Adam, so it actually felt sacred. So choose the something you love, Get, put it at a time on the calendar when you know you're going to respect it and do it as a ceremony. And a ceremony has two aspects. It has ritual and it has reverence. So it works best if you combine this with other people. Like even though I meditate alone, my family knows that I meditate in the morning and they are incredibly supportive and they always say, did you meditate? How was your meditation? So they're very supportive. So it's a group thing. So if you can only Skype or call a friend who, who's going to connect with you about this ritual. It's really best if you can have at least one person doing it at the same time as you. And then instead of just starting to do the thing you love, put ritual around it. So if you like to play Candy Crush, start it by going to your favorite chair, sitting down with a nice blanket, putting on your favorite um, shawl or whatever, reading glasses, and um, like having the cat sit on your lap, and then you play Candy Crush. Or um, um, when we go down to do our morning communion, um, instead of just walking in there, I have a certain sequence of things we do. We sit down, we open our, our cell phones, everybody reports on a news story of the world. Then we go to other apps that make us happy to report things like funny jokes. In fact, um, I wanted to say something about doing it reverently, which just means respecting it and doing it no matter what. It's good if you have a dog or an atom around who will not let you get out of it. But one of the things that I love, I was told to be reverent as a little Mormon girl in church and I hated it. So I grew up to be incredibly irreverent, but I'm actually reverent about my irreverence. My irreverence is a ritual. So the way I, I, I go to affirmation sites and I look, for weird animal pictures and I put affirmations together with weird animal pictures like it'll be a picture of a dog like doing a face plant on a yard and it will say everything I do is divinely guided and I make these stupid little affirmation things that I can't use because I love to and that's part of my morning ritual anything you do as long as you do it as long as you love it will bring in um, will bring you a sense of deep fulfillment and a way of looking forward to every day, structure in every day. So my whole takeaway is instead of structuring around work, 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 create structures of joy and make them things that can't be broken, appointments that can't be broken because they're for your soul, they're for your spirit, they're for your the people you love and the connection between you. And those things are so much more important than everything that we can't do because of COVID, right? And when you do that and your life starts to be structured in a sequence of sacred ceremonies, uh, the light comes in through that process. Like it brings a lightness and a joy and a communion and an illumination to your world that, that is the reason all those cultures live with so much ritual. So I think it's, an, it's a universal human trait. And I thought it would be great if we could all try that. And that's what the gathering room is for me. It's sacred. It's something I look forward to. I do it ceremoniously. I set everything up in a certain way. I sit down, I put the right things into my computer, and then I see your faces, and then I talk. And then we go to questions because that's the way the ceremony works. So I have some questions here sent to me by, by our gracious badger who is loving you from off screen. So Donna says, how can we find rituals when work has intensified during COVID and the work for equity is both exhilarating and never ending? I seem to work more now. The list never ends. This is true. I was reading a, um, an article about the monstrosity of the American work system and how so many white collar professionals are doing work that doesn't add any value to the world, but it's draining their life and their energy and taking all their time. Now, I don't know what you do for a living, Donna, but I, you will find there are times when you, you just zone out because you can't work 20 hours a day like a machine. That's why 
Henry Ford's plants could never hold on to a worker for more than a month. We can't work like robots. So we end up, if we try to work like robots, we end up at a certain point, usually after 90 minutes, there's an old tradian rhythm that makes us just hit the wall. And we sit there and we try to keep working, but really we'll, we're just staring. Notice the times in your day when you're not productive and decide, I'm gonna do my work for 60 minutes. I do this all the time, set a timer. And after that 60 minutes, I'm gonna do 30 minutes of something, I'm gonna play Candy Crush as a sacred ritual for myself, for my own healing. Um, the more you let, the, the, the work expands to fit the time allotted. So you've got to just a lot less time and then insist on, on the, um, the sacred ritual. And for me, working for equity, like um, the reading that I've been doing and the, I, I'm so into this, it is both exhilarating and, and never ending. And for me, I only do it as a sacred ceremony. Like when I sit down with the books that I've, the, the latest book, or when I am talking to a friend, I can have like frank, brutal, right out there discussions with African-American friends now. And it's just, it's sacred time. You set it aside, you respect it, you honor it. Um, and it becomes, the, the good fight becomes exactly like the blessing way ceremony. I was talking to a friend yesterday who said, and he's so sacred, he's so cute, and he always has to end our conversations with this sacred, to me, sacred, but with a special hugging sound on the phone. Um, and he was saying, you know, we have, to, we have to love the people out there who are driving us crazy. We have to love them and make them feel safe. We've got to make the whole world feel safe if it's ever going to be sane again. And um, the, what, the sacredness he brought to the task and the way he started out with this burst of joy and ended with this audible hug, it was the most sacred ceremony I could imagine. And, and I am putting in my calendar times to call him back because he's just pure spirit and so beautiful. Oh, Emily asked, tree pheromones, what's that? Did you know we co-evolved to uh, breathe in pheromones from the trees? You know that animals put out pheromones, right? Moths and stuff, so do we. So do trees, all plants, all life puts out pheromones. We sense them with an organ inside our noses. We don't smell, they don't smell like anything, but our brains pick them up. And we are so constructed that when we go into an environment full of plants, within about three hours, our natural killer T cells, the protective cells in our immune system, double. When you go out among the trees and breathe their ferritin pheromones, they're mostly carotenoids, I think, I don't know. But um, I could look it up for you. But I do know that by breathing the air that has been breathed out into by the trees, we connect with the literal plant life around us and it makes our immune systems work much, much, much better. It's not just a little effect, it's dramatic. Anne says, no one phones me during Jeopardy. Amen, sister. That's a fantastic ritual, I love it. Okay, Anne says, book reading time every single night. Right, right. I was, oh. I was reading my um, sociology stuff at night, my equity stuff, and I would get so fired up and sometimes so horrified that I couldn't sleep. And so that had to take an earlier time in the day. And then I put reading something like literature at night because it puts me to sleep so sacred. I mean, the act of picking up a book and smelling its pages or picking up your Kindle and leafing through it. It's all sacred ceremony. And if you do it four days in a row, you will already have established in your own nervous system the expectation that that will continue. They say it takes 21 days to cement a, a habit into your brain so that you will always do that thing. But it only takes four days to set up an expectation if you've got a dog, it only takes five minutes if, you're, if it involves food. But if you just do something four days in a row, actually on the fourth day, the first day, time it's like, whoa, I don't know, this is kind of weird. The second time it's like, okay, I did this once, I can do it again. The third day is like, well, three's the charm. And the fourth day is like, oh yeah, that's something I do. And after four, it's just part of your life and you will respect it. So keep going through that first four days 
you'll be golden. Pam says, I have my tea and my gathering room, a favorite ritual with all these friends. Isn't it amazing? I just wanted more ritual. And so I just started broadcasting. It's ridiculous. And here you are, and we're having the most wonderful time. Okay, Supriya says, what's the consensus on affirmations? Sometimes it feels like the repetition reiterates my doubt. Yeah. There's something in the brain called the ironic monitoring process. And the problem with it is that if you have an affirmation like, I see greatness in all I do, that signals the ironic monitoring process in your brain to go around looking for places where you don't see greatness because there's an underlying fear behind every affirmation is its opposite. Like, I see greatness in all I do is kind of like I doth protest too much about maybe not seeing so much greatness in all I do. So you're sending the brain to go look for contradictions. And for many people, for me, now affirmations may be perfect for you, but for me, I have this weird boomerang effect where I say an affirmation enough times that I'm feeling really great every day in every way. I'm getting better and better. And it's just getting better and better. And then the ironic monitoring in my process in my brain is saying, no, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. That's ridiculous. Every day in every way, how could it be? And then it hits me like a thunderclap. No, things are going wrong everywhere. And I end up curled up in the corner of a room whining like a kicked puppy. I know I can't do the affirmations so much, but if they work for you, they're great. And also if you put them with funny animal pictures, awesome. You will love them. Okay. Nick says, rituals are very important. I do them in my classroom. I'm a teacher. And the children immediately notice when the ritual is not kept. It brings a certain rest and structure. That is exactly right. And the fact that Nick is telling us about children really backs up what I think, which is that this is an inherent thing in all humans that, we, that ritual is a framework on our time. And the, what Nick says, a certain rest and structure to the day. When you know you can rest in the schedule of the day, a lot of your fear goes away. Um, I've worked at home forever, but even so, when COVID came and there weren't things in my schedule about travel and I didn't have to fit things in here and there for other organizations, for work-related reasons, it, the, the day felt kind of weird and helter-skelter. And that's when all these rituals started coming in my family, they started emerging in the family. And I just noticed, I mean, there, no, nothing bad's gonna happen if we skip one or change one, but I just noticed how much rest and, and structure, as Nick said, it brought to my day. So it's not just children. Do this, put rituals throughout your day and never vary the ritual. And you will start to feel a kind of ease that your mind and your nervous system are going into a kind of rhythm with it. And within that rhythm, creativity arises, uh, joy arises, connection arises, and the divine emerges. It's, uh, so there's a reason that every single culture on earth, when it tries to go into the mystery, does so with ritual and ceremony. Um, when I was, as I said, the religion I was part of as a child, they did it to death. They did it with things that didn't feel sacred to me, and I tried to fake it and it didn't work. So that's why I stay, say start with something that gives you genuine joy. Turn it into a ritual. Bring uh, ceremonial sort of repetition, ritual and reverence to it. And do it every day for four days. And watch how it calms you. Okay. So Jessica Bingaman asks, what are you reading now, Martha? Ooh. Um, I'm reading uh, a book by Lonnie Love called I Tried to Set Change So You Wouldn't Have To, which is about her experience as a black comedian. I'm reading, um, for contrast, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome, which I've always believed in uh, when I read about post traumatic, uh, post traumatic disorder, PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. I thought, good Lord, anyone who has forebears who've been through slavery have got to have had both the experiential and the epigenetic aspects of post-traumatic stress disorder um, built into that experience. It was one of the most 
horrific things that ever happened to people in the world. And I'm also reading a fabulous science fiction book called The Doomsday Book about people who can travel through time and they go back and check out the Middle Ages when there were plagues everywhere. And I'm seeing what I can learn about living through a plague in fiction. So you guys, this is a ceremony for me. This is a sacred ritual and it gives structure to my weeks and the month that, that I took off. I missed you guys and I missed the ritual and I'm so grateful that we show up together because that is the biggest payoff. If you start doing things in a sacred way, others join in because we inherently want to move to that rhythm. We inherently want to join in that sacred way that has nothing to do with money and it has nothing to do with religious oppression, it has everything to do with souls and hearts that are beating in synchrony. So thank you for showing up for my ritual. I hope you tell me about all the wonderful rituals that you can have this week. And just remember, do it four days and just see if it doesn't start to make your life feel so much more sacred and so much more joyful. Love you guys. Thanks for coming. You're the best.